dirt. That's dirt. Why, this wouldn't happen offshore. So allow me to recommend this view because I feel obliged to confront my lack of a dodger in a moment. Because what we're really doing today is having a test sale of the necessary refit that has to occur after any long ocean voyage. I was gratified to find when I, when I got back that my heavy duty sails, which have 10,000 miles on them now on this boat, two Hawaii trips, and which are made of very heavy 9.1 ounce Dacron, have stood the test very well. There's, there's almost no apparent wear on them. That's where the Genoa halyard enters the mast. It's very strong Dyneema line, which leads back to its clutch because I don't adjust the halyard tension of the Genoa very often. But it turns out that in the inevitable flexing of the rig, which has the effect of doing this, just changing the lead of the halyard as it goes into the mast, causes chafe but there's a simple solution to that and that's just to end for end the genoa halyard reverse it and the chafe comes up in a different spot and then can't build up indefinitely into a problem this is the end of january in los angeles and occasionally you get these remarkable 75 degree days with 12 knots right smack dab in the middle of what everybody else every right thinking person anywhere in the world considers Winter. Malibu. It looks a little like Oahu, but it's not. That pesky leak that certainly got my attention the first day out of Hawaii coming home turned out to be not much of a problem at all after I plugged the drain hole in the anchor locker. And when I got back, I yanked the anchor chain pan right out of the boat and went down there and uh, found that the the uh, drain tube that went through the stem that's the, the very bow of the boat uh, had been manufactured of copper tubing it had corroded completely in half I replaced it with a half inch outside diameter piece of stainless steel tubing put on a new drain hose and that's that forever the long voyage really beat up my Genoa sheets, but those double braided sheets had been good for me for uh, 10,000 miles. And these are the new ones, it's the same thing. I use one long Genoa sheet with a lark's head knot, also called a luggage tag knot. And it makes less of a bump going around the stays than, than independently tied bolums. Very pleased. Small things are what matter. With my choice of switching to a single braid line for the main sheet. I put this on a year ago or, or so, wondering if it was really up to the rigors of running through all these blocks and being adjusted day and night constantly. And the short answer is it is. And my salesmanship for this design of rope is mostly its extreme flexibility, disinclination to foul and ease on the hands. Why, it's like a pair of kid gloves, don't you know? Single braid, not double braid. I used the same line on the uh, Genoa roller furling control line. You know, the line that goes around the drum under the roller furling gear up on the bow, and which is in constant use, readjusting the square footage of the foresail and which of course broke twice. And I thought, well, there must be some inherent weakness in single braid because that's what I was using for this as well. This is double braid, more standard stuff. 
But it turned out that was an incorrect assumption also. It had nothing to do with the strength of the line. It had everything to do, I eventually figured out, with the lead of the control line from this block here. And that under certain conditions, it could chafe against the drum here, depending on how the roll happened to occur inside the drum. And for that, the solution was simply to move this block forward a little bit. It just never happened, stay sailing. Cape Horn self-steering wind vane is in precisely the same condition it was out of the box a year ago. And now it actually works after what amounted to a shakedown cruise in which I had a good deal of trouble with an elaborate uh, blow decks installation coming apart such that it makes me really wonder whether this is a suitable installation for boats like this. It's so complicated, and yet, and yet, and yet, in the end, it did work quite well. And uh, the Cape Horn has the, in exchange for its complication, because its mechanisms are below decks, which is unusual with self-steering gears, self-steering wind vanes. The fact is that there is absolutely no drum and line interfering with the cockpit the way there is on, on most uh, self-steering vane installations. And that's one of the great advantages of the Cape Horn. And I think that when I take eight people sailing next summer, I'll really appreciate not having to step over things. I came around to liking the Cape Horn a good deal. Just be prepared for a difficult installation and maintenance that requires crawling under the cockpit. Yeah, carbon fiber, I, I have learned that it's a, let's call it an acquired taste. The carbon fiber spinnaker pole that broke, well, when I took it home in the fall, I took it apart and examined it again, I thought that my repaired C was really about as good as I could do. So it's now a fixed length pole of uh, 16 feet, I think, which works pretty well. And uh, if I set out again on a cruise that has a long dead downwind leg, I, uh, with a little effort, can reestablish the internal line control mechanism so that it can extend to 18 or even 19 feet, which is useful sometimes under light air conditions. A couple of months at sea and the varnish takes a tremendous beating. So uh, part of the refit afterwards was putting another two coats of varnish on the exterior. I use uh, Interlux Schooner. It's a traditional spar varnish. And that goes as well for all this stuff that's exposed to the UV. They get faded and actually peeling, if you can believe it, after just one summer, 24 hours a day. I usually apply another two coats of maintenance varnish every two years or so anyhow. And for anything exposed to the outdoors, like these surrounds are on the companionway, the high gloss is a must, it's the toughest. That includes the, the companionway ladder, which is exposed to UV. It takes a lot of kicking and bumping in the surrounding areas as well, and the sole. This boat was made in 1984, and this is the original cabin sole, teak and holly, the veneer on almost three quarter an inch marine plywood. Quite a job and difficult to replace. So. I think it's amazing that after all this time, some care and some varnish brings this Ericsson interior pretty much back to the acceptable level. It's, it seems a bit strange to have 12 targets on the ship alarm. Brings back 
memories. And yeah, uh, and also, we're not at sea. There's things we could hit. Uh, by the way, this is this is a yacht engine that flies from the leech of the mainsail for 10,000 miles, and this is how it came out. And I wanted to honor it. Um, Or actually, I flew this on three round trips to Hawaii, so it, it, indeed it is 15,000 nautical miles, and in the end, comes out looking like the, the rest of us after 15,000 miles. Actually in better condition than I was. And I think I will continue to leave up the somewhat daunting daily notes on how we're doing a hieroglyph that even the ancient Egyptians couldn't read, but this is day 15. This is a wind arrow showing the predicted winds, and a lot of them have been smudged and drawn out over as they change. And when the day's finished and I do the noon position report, cross the day off. So, on the topic of Dodgers and Brussels sprouts because to a large extent my uh, stance on Dodgers is a matter of personal taste I think um, every time I go to a dinner party and the host pulls out a big tray of steaming Brussels sprouts everyone cheers and I back quietly away most cruising people I think feel including my red-headed wife who would I think prefer to have a Dodger is that they afford lots of sun protection for fair-skinned people, well, do they? From the Dodgers that I've examined, few of them really provide much shade protection at all for the cockpit. And if they do, they tend to extend so far back as to interrupt the all-important passage from cockpit to deck, especially on smaller boats. It seems to me that the major purpose of a Dodger on most cruising boats in sunny climates is to be able to extend a total cockpit cover, a cover that occludes the sky and the sails, that connects the Dodger to a bimini at the start of the boat, which covers the helmsman, so that the result is sailing in a sort of oceanic garage. Well, that's okay, but you know, for me, that's absolutely impossible. Uh, my tendency is to constantly look at the sails all the time. It's not a habit I can break or want to break, so anything over my head is unacceptable. If you look around a marina, almost every cruising boat seems to have a Dodger, and the racing boats don't seem to have Dodgers at all. I don't know why that might be, except that a dodger covering the companionway of a boat interferes with almost all of the critical controls. The lines, which are led forward to the mast, have to go through mouse holes. The winches are somewhat occluded by the presence of fabric and stainless tubing around them. If they're necessary, they're necessary, but are they? I live in the same world everybody else does. I, I need uh, protection from the sun. And I, when, it, when it's squally or rainy, especially at a mooring, I need some way to keep the uh, companionway uh, hashboard off so that I can breathe down there. And here are my workarounds. Instead of a bimini, or an all-enclosing cockpit cover, I pop up a $100 market umbrella, which uh, is good up to 20 or 25 knots, believe it or not. And when you don't need sun protection, it folds up and you throw it down below. That's that. Well, you're right. When it's hot as blazes and raining, as it often is at Anchorage, you need some way to keep the hatch open. And, and my solution to that is this Rube Goldberg device. 
It's a piece of light plywood made to stick into the companionway hatch and extend the uh, coach roof back so that the water uh, pours off and not into the cabin. Now, why would anybody in his right mind not want sun protection over the cockpit? Well, people in their right minds do. When we're at an anchorage, I unfold our, my 10 by 13 foot cockpit cover, which, which gives sun and rain protection all the way from the companionway to the transom. Yes, let's admit it, no doubt about it. It's a matter of personal taste. I hate Dodgers. I've always hated them. I've never had one on any boat that I've ever had. I hope to go on without ever having one. They have their uses, but I have a recommendation. If you have never sailed without a Dodger on your boat, and perhaps you're in the market for a new Dodger, I recommend taking a few months of sailing without a Dodger and see how it goes. You might find that you don't need it all of the time. Now, certainly if you're at anchor in the South Seas, living aboard, a, a Dodger is an absolute necessity. But most of us don't do that. Most of us go out day sailing or for a weekend cruise with the family. And it really might profit all of us to stop and think of whether we need this rather expensive, cumbersome object at all. I think what it all comes down to after this tour of my own opinions is that most people accept the need for a Dodger as fiat. They look around, everyone has one, let's get one too. What I'm saying is, think it through. You might not need one. And if you don't need a Dodger, if you can live without a Dodger, everything is simpler from visibility to expense to the look of a sailboat in profile sailing along on a pretty afternoon.